Now, uh, with great pleasure, let me just uh, introduce uh, to you today's speakers, Mansi Agarwal, who is a data scientist at Rupik, and Sneha Saxena, who is also a data scientist at Grubhub. Today's session is about hypothesis testing and experimentation. And uh, just a disclaimer before we start, there is, we will be giving certificate for participation. And there are a few eligibility criteria. Uh, you have to show ability to demonstrate good application and understanding of ML statistics by the end of the series. You can attend at least, you have to attend at least three to four, three out of four first uh, four sessions. Uh, attempt and obtain at least 50% or more on the final quiz that will happen in two weeks on June 11th. And all the previous sessions are actually uploaded and available to watch in our YouTube channel. So if you have missed any, you will be able to catch up. And also, as I said, the next session will be about wrap up, like the wrap up session. And we will also have a, a hands on coding workshop where we will go through all the uh, theories we have learned so far. We will have a coding uh, supplement for that. And the next session, it will be on June 11th, 11 a.m. ETT and 8.30 p.m. IST. So that's all from me. Now uh, I would like to pass it over to uh, Mansi. Thank you, Zareen. Uh, I'm just quickly sharing my screen. Is my screen visible? Yes. All right. Thank you everyone for joining the fourth session of uh, Statistics for Machine Learning series. My name is Mansi Agarwal and I will be one of the speakers for today's session that is on hypothesis testing and experimentation. Uh, this presentation will be shared with all the, particip uh, all the participants uh, after the session. So uh, you need not worry uh, though like to take notes or something, you can just concentrate on the presentation for now. All right, let's start. So uh, today's agenda will be a quick introduction on hypothesis testing. Uh, what are actually the steps undertaken to conduct a hypothesis test? What are type one and type two errors? And then our speaker Sneha will take you over the st different statistical tests that are t-tests, chi-squared and analysis of variance. And then a real life experimentation and how to conduct ex uh, hypothesis testing at your workplace with a real world example. So let's begin. So a hypothesis in very crude terms is an educated guess about something in the world around you. Uh, in, if we rule out the statistics for a minute, you can also, you uh, by plain English terms, hypothesis is like a guess. And uh, you must, or if you're working professional, you might also have a business user making a hypothesis that, hey, this is the hypothesis that, uh, uh, from the previous trend, I think the sales, we think the sales of May will be at least uh, $5 million. So this is like a hypothesis and they, it can be tested either by experiment, either by a forecasting model or by observation. Like if May ends and it has been $5 million indeed, so their hypothesis was true. So this is an educated guess. It's not just a random guess. You have to make it after deliberation and experiments and observations of the past. For example, a new medicine you think might work. A pharmaceutical company thinks that a new medicine will work. A way of teaching you think might be better. So like uh, there are two teachers and you think one might be better on some kind of uh, parameters. A possible location for a new species and a fairer way to administer standardized tests. So these are some kind of hypothesis in real life. Hypothesis testing is a very essential procedure in statistics. So hypothesis test evaluates two mutually exclusive statements about the population to determine which statement is best supported by sample data. When we uh, talk about probability theory, two mutually exclusive statement means that they cannot occur on the same time. So we are testing two uh, statements, two claims that are mutually exclusive that cannot happen at the same time. Either one is true, or, uh, and the other is false. This is the only scenario. And uh, uh, when, I, when I say that this is uh, like uh, tested on a sample, 
uh, uh, we do we conduct experimentation hypothesis testing on a sample and then we conclude if this observation is a good representation of the population also so hypothesis testing is conducted on a sample data and when we say that finding the finding that the conclusion is statistically significant it's thanks to hypothesis test so you might see a lot of uh, jargon here so don't worry stay with us and we'll clear all these terminologies in the slides to come so let's understand hypothesis testing with an example suppose you're a pharmaceutical company and you have launched a new drug in the market and now you want to check what percentage of the country's population will use this drug when they have the related disease. So that you want to focus the drug's future production to match the demand. Do you survey the country's entire population and get the details from them? This doesn't make sense. This is like, a, uh, like it is an impractical thing to do. It's inefficient. It's not logical, given that uh, the data science uh, domain is progressing and you can make educated guesses or like... Uh, uh, forecast the drug's future production, set, like given some parameters, given some existing data and business acumen, obviously. So what do we do? We start by taking small groups of population throughout the country, considering many factors. Factors could be east of India, west of India, north of India and south of India, different dialects, different demographics. This could be like uh, different factors and you pick small, small groups of uh, population from each of these sectors and like considering factors, these factors. These small groups of people are called samples. Now, according to existing data in sales, you have an assumption that, okay, 20% of the population will use the new drug. And now you need to prove these assumptions using these samples that you picked in the first step. This assumption based on a reasoning, re what was the reasoning? We have existing data in sales and uh, we, uh, we make an assumption that 20% of the population will be using this data. So this is the reasoning. We have existing data in sales. This is called a hypothesis that the 20% of the population is the assumption. It's called the hypothesis. And the method we used to test this hypothesis is called hypothesis testing. Uh, if you have studied probability in your school, high school uh, or college, uh, flipping a coin, getting heads and tails is the most uh, accessible and the most commonly used example. So we are also going to use the same example to see how to conduct a hypothesis test. So there are two roommates, uh, Bill and Jack, they play a game that if uh, the coin lands on heads, Bill will do the dishes that night. Or if it's tail, that means Jack does the dishes. Let's say on the first two point tosses uh, landed on tails. That is uh, the first night also, the second night also. Is it uh, like uh, Jack should make an assumption that, okay, Bill might be using a the coin. But if you see the probability of the coin landing on tails two times in a row, that is two nights in a row is 25%, which is not in unlikely. Like, he, there is a very fair chance that, okay, two nights in a row, you might have to do the dishes. But let's take another scenario. What if the coin lands on tail six times in a row? So the first night probability into the second night, so on till this uh, last night, the sixth night is one by two power six, which is one by 64, which is actually 0 0.0156. That is 1.56%. This is very unlikely. So now Jack has all, like, it is very fair for him to assume that, okay, now the coin might be rigged. So typically in hypothesis testing, one would set a threshold, which is usually 5%, to determine if the event occurred is by chance or not. So if the I am taking the first light, 25%, which is greater than 5%. So like reasonable threshold has been crossed. That means look, the, this is very likely and the coin might not be rigged. It is way below the threshold. We have very strong evidence that, okay, Bill might be using a rigged, a rigged coin. That is, there is like very, very little chance, less than 2% chance that all six nights I have to do the dishes. So this, we usually set a threshold and industry standard is to set the threshold to 5%. Let's understand, this, uh, let's understand all these terms in a statistical manner. So first is the null hypothesis. The hypothesis that the sample observations result purely from chance. That is the first scenario. 
uh, like there is no change. The null hypothesis tends to, uh, to state that there is no change. Everything is normal. Everything is fine. And it is assumed to be true unless proven otherwise, which you might have be uh, might have been he hearing in legal terminology also. That is a person, uh, like a person convicted is innocent until proven guilty. So either it, he will be acquitted or either he'll be penalized. So he is innocent until proven guilty. Alternative hypothesis is the hypothesis that the sample observations are influ influenced by some non-random cause. It is an attempt to disapprove the null hypothesis when we get enough evidence to reject it. Now, p-value. P-value is a very hot topic. This is something you might be hearing a lot of times, and this is a very important concept in statistics also. It is the probability of obtaining the results, observed results of a test, assuming that that null hypothesis is correct. So that means, uh, like, uh, what is the probability that there will be six uh, uh, tails in a row, uh, the probability is 2%, but two tails in a row is a 25% probability. So a smaller p-value means that there is a very strong evidence in favor of the alternated hypothesis. And alpha is the significance level, that is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it's true. This is an error, type 1 error. We'll clear everything. Uh, now, uh, my, I, my, I request the participants to like, correlate these terms in context of example and uh, tell me in the chat what the null hypothesis in our Bill and Jack example would be. What is the null hypothesis there? Just take a guess. I'll, I'll show you the definition also once again. You can just take an assumption here. We're not getting a lot of responses in chat, so I think. Okay, the null hypothesis in our example is that the coin is a fair coin. Uh, that means the observa observations are purely from chance. There is nothing wrong with the coin. Uh, Bill has not rigged the coin. If you're getting two nights in a row, it's a fairly uh, possible scenario and the coin is not rigged. Nothing is wrong. There is no change. State of no change is null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis would be uh, that the coin is not fair and thus the observations did not happen by chance. Now the p-value in this scenario is flipping the tails two times in a row is 25%. That is, uh, if you uh, like uh, recall the definition, p-value is the probability of getting the observed results. So getting the observed results uh, like two times in a row is 25% and getting an observed result of six heads in a row is 1.56%. Uh, and alpha or the level of significance as I, I call the threshold is 5%. So now we were talking about how do we uh, measure or how do we decide if the coin is rigged or not? That is how do we reject or accept the null hypothesis? So the main rule in determining whether you reject the null, null is simple. If the p-value is greater than alpha, that is if p-value is greater than level of significance, that is 5%, do not reject the null hypothesis. Why? Uh, if the, P, the chance of occurrence that is two times in a row is 25%, that means it is fairly unlikely. It is greater than the level of uh, significance. If you are conducting the experiment two times, uh, we cannot reject the null hypothesis. However, in the case of flipping six times in a row, we are conducting the experiment six times. We would reject the null since 1.56 is less than five. So here comes a very good uh, point of discussion is uh, this is like hypothesis testing and your conclusion from hypothesis testing would also depend on the number of experiments or the number of times you're conducting an experiment. So this is something uh, a person or industry or business users have to decide considering their data and data problems. How many experiments are too many experiments or how many experiments are enough to assess the conclusivity or the uh, significance of a test. So if Jack had only flipped it two times, 
he he would find uh, a 25 percent p value which is greater than significance he would have like not rejected the null hypothesis that means coin is fair but if he conducted the experiment six times he would be having sufficient evidence to reject reject the null hypothesis that okay this is unlikely this is like a very low chance uh, uh only two less than two percent chance i can i have claim i have enough evidence to say that the coin is rigged how do we know if the p-value is statistically significant? That's what we were talking about here. So the level of statistical significance is often expressed as a p-value probability between 0 to 1. Probability lies between 0 to 1. A small p-value, the smaller the p-value, we have a stronger evidence that we can reject the null hypothesis. Like if he could uh, like uh, continue the experiment 10 times, 20 times. So it would be if he's getting ahead 20 times, that is one by two power 20. He has even stronger evidence to reject the null hypothesis that he has even stronger evidence to say that, hey, Bill, you're using a rigged coin. So that depends on the number of experiments you're conducting. A p-value of less than 0 0.05, that is 5%, is statistically significant, usually, typically. It indicates that a strong evidence against null hypothesis as there is a less than 5% probability that the null hypothesis is correct. Uh, uh, people, if you have any questions, please, like, uh, it might be getting overwhelming to have this a lot of jargon. Please keep uh, putting a question in the Q&A box if there is any. But, however, this does not mean that a 95% probability that the alternative hypothesis is true. This means a p-value of higher than 5% is not statistically significant and indicates strong evidence for the null hypothesis. This means we retain the null hypothesis and reject the alternative hypothesis. You should note that you, can, you cannot accept the null. You can only reject or fail to reject the null. I'll explain you what is happening here. It, is, it means that uh, if I flip the coin, two times, I get a 25% uh, probability. So here, I don't have sufficient evidence to make a claim that the coin might be rigged. But if I'm conducting the experiment six times, I might have a chance to, like fair chance to reject the null hypothesis. That is the coin is a fair coin. In that case, like uh, it is a, uh, like a gamble of how many experiments you're conducting and what is the threshold. So here we can only either reject the null or fail to reject that is we are not saying that you're absolved of all claims we just don't have in like sufficient evidence to actually say that okay your coin might be rigged or not so this is the only thing that we're talking about and it is uh, very important to understand the terminology here and sometimes like uh, you would also see uh, like very uh, explicit people like very explicitly that uh, criminals are walking free that they are acquitted that's not because like they ha might have not committed a crime or something it's just that the prosecution could not prove that the uh, person did a crime or not so uh, that was that's exactly what hypothesis testing talks about that we didn't have enough ev evidence to prosecute you or to penalize you that's why you're walking free does not mean that we have we are saying we are accepting the alternative hypothesis that you have not done any crime. We're just failing to uh, prove it. So now like, failing to prove and accepting wrong things or wrong people getting acquitted, we're talking about errors now. And what are type one and type two errors? This is a very uh, uh, like interesting example. A person telling uh, a man that he's pregnant and a person, uh, a doctor telling a pregnant woman that she's not pregnant. We'll understand this, we'll come back to the example and then you will tell me what was wrong here when I explain you the type one and type two error. So type one occurs when you have incorrectly rejected a true null hypothesis. That means uh, if uh, the hypothesis was that uh, it is a fair point, and I have incorrectly rejected a true one. That means uh, I have say, uh, like incorrectly re rejected means uh, that it was indeed a fair coin. And I said that, hey, no, it was a rigged coin. Like 
another way to remember it is it's a false positive that we have falsely said that hey it's rigged coin we have incorrectly rejected a true null hypothesis one example you did a study comparing happiness levels between people who were given a puppy to hold versus puppy to merely look at your null hypothesis would be that there is no statistical significant difference in happiness levels between those who held a puppy or those who looked at a puppy however suppose there was no real difference in happiness which is to say people are actually just as happy to look at a puppy or hold a puppy if your statistical test was significant you would have then committed a type 1 error statistical test was significant means that you have evidence to reject the null that means you say that yes there is a difference between uh, people looking at puppy and people holding a puppy you have committed a type 1 error in another words you found the statistical result merely due to a chance that means your sample must be wrong or you're talking to very few people or you're not covering a larger sample base so you have committed a type 1 error you said that there is a difference whereas there was not a difference indeed the flip side of it is type 2 error failing to reject a false null hypothesis this would be a false negative like one example uh the same example suppose that you found there was no statistical difference between the groups but in reality people who hold puppies are actually much happier than just looking at one in this case you incorrectly failed to reject the null hypothesis that means matlab uh, that means that you had to reject it and you failed to reject it because you said that there was not a difference this is a type 2 error so in the chat can you quickly tell me why has he committed a type 1 error what kind of false positive like what must have been the null hypothesis that he rejected incorrectly so in this example tell me the null hypothesis in this example tell me the null hypothesis first example am i not able to see the chat or we are actually not getting any responses in the first one that is correct uh, the null is not pregnant that means he has committed an error by like incorrectly rejecting the null he has made a false positive that is the null here that the null was that you are not pregnant and he says that i have test results that claim that you are pregnant that means his test is faulty his test is falsely significant so he's committed a false positive type one error what like the flip side what is the uh, null hypothesis here that he, she is pregnant and uh, like she, uh, yeah she is not pregnant is the null hypothesis and she has incorrectly accept like failed to reject it so her test is a false negative uh, any issue in this example could be tricky please ask us in the q and a and because uh, before moving ahead uh we would like to clear uh all the doubts so that uh the next sections are lit getting a little theoretical uh so i think uh, zareen we can take questions if they have any before moving to the next sections sure mansi uh there is one question in the chat so uh anastasia asks in the example with the coin toss when we talk about repeating the experiment is it not that we should repeat the action of tossing a coin six times in a row which is only one iteration of the experiment meaning if we toss the coin six times it's not a repetition of the experiment just one iteration of it no uh i'll i'll tell you what happens here is uh uh repeating the like when we flip a coin once getting a head and tails is a mutually exclusive event like you cannot get one uh, like one observation like when you get a tail your one experiment one observation has been noted experiment ended when you flip a coin twice this is a second experiment you are experimenting with the same uh, with the same coin again i hope that is clear like when you make an observation that is one experiment 
making an observation out of uh, a, a conducting experiment is a closure of that experiment if the coin is like uh, like make uh, like uh, i mean if you're conducting it six times that is six experiments because you, you are getting six different observations that's great uh, thanks for the explanation mansi there is one more question so alia ask shouldn't the null in women's case be you are pregnant okay what is a type 2 error type 2 error means failing to reject a false null hypothesis null hypothesis here is you are not pregnant and she is failing to reject it she is not rejecting it she is actually saying that you are not pregnant she is stating the null again whereas she would have to find when she was conducting a test when she was conducting a pregnancy test if the test was statistically significant it should have come out as an like in evidence of the alternative hypothesis she would have enough evidence to reject it but is she is failing to reject it that means the null was you are not pregnant uh Alia, uh, just let us know in the chat if uh, it's clear. Otherwise, it, I'll explain it again. Yeah, Alia says okay. Thanks. Okay. okay. Great. So that's all the questions we have, Mansi. Please move on. Yeah. So now I'll hand over to my fellow speaker Sneha, which will take you through the next sorry next sections of this presentation. Over to you, Sneha. Thanks, Fancy. I think that was a great introduction to all the important concepts around hypothesis testing. And now we would like to talk a little more in detail about what kind of tests we can use uh, when it comes to hypothesis testing. And then we'll talk briefly about experimentation and uh, what or how it's used in the real world. Okay. so. We already kind of covered that hypothesis testing is used to essentially infer properties of the population by using a sample. So you try to pick a sample or multiple samples from the population and get their means, get their standard deviations, uh, uh, maybe variances or whatever is needed. And then you utilize the uh, statistical methodologies such as hypothesis testing and the tests that are that we're going to talk about here to really infer what the mean or the standard deviation of your population might be. Now, statistic, now for example, you have two different groups that you're trying to look at and you have the samples related to those and you have their means uh, for instance, and then how are you going to actually statistically compute uh, the p-values or any other statistic that will help you in validating or rejecting the null hypothesis? There are a few different ways of doing this, and based on the use case that you are dealing with, you could choose four different ways of doing it. You can use the means, you can use differences of means, proportions, or just relationship between the different variables that you're interested in. I think within the real world, it is fairly common to see using means um, and the tests related to utilizing mean as your uh, kind of summary statistic that is compared to understand and decide if your null hypothesis is valid or ha or you have enough evidence to reject it. To that effect, there are several statistical tests that can be used for different kinds of scenarios in hypothesis testing. And some of the most common ones are t-test, chi-square test, and ANOVA that we will talk about in today's session. Um, can we move on to the next one? Thank you. Okay, so first we'll talk about t-test. Like I mentioned, uh, we, we usually see uh, using means is what we uh, do in the real world or in academia even to compare two different groups and check for our null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis. 
So essentially, t-test is a statistical method that helps us understand the difference between two groups that we want to compare. And what it does is essentially it, it uses the null hypothesis that there is no difference between the means of the two groups. So that's a null hypothesis. If you look at the kind of the graph at the bottom right, we see that null hypothesis um, in both cases of one-tailed and two-tailed, which we'll talk about in a minute, is your H naught is mu one equal to mu two, which is what we're trying to say for the null hypothesis is that group one and group two have essentially the same means. Um, and then you will utilize a t-test to determine if that is true or not. In order to use a t-test, we have certain assumptions that need to be checked um, before we can, we can actually employ this method. The assumptions are the data has to follow a continuous or an ordinal scale, which is um, kind of self-explanatory. If there's any question around that, please put that in the Q&A and we can answer that for you. The second aspect is that the data or the sample that you're going to use in the test is randomly selected from the population. I think I just want to iterate that in any statistical method, and especially when you're talking about hypothesis testing or experimentation, it is very important that we are doing everything possible to keep bias out of our samples. Um, and then, which is why you need your samples to be randomly selected. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in um, when we talk about experimentation in the real world, because there are obviously some challenges related to randomly selecting your samples. And random uh, is, is always kind of pseudo random. There's no real random uh, in, in the real world. And the third assumption is that the data has to be normally distributed. I think in the previous sessions, we also highlighted that when we were talking about normal distribution, why it is so important in statistics and other aspects of machine learning and how that leads into uh, your central limit theorem, which can again be utilized when you have smaller sample sizes and you're attempting to do hypothesis testing or any of these other met methodologies. Okay, moving on to the different types of t-tests that are available. Like I mentioned, there are n number of statistical tests that are available for various scenarios. And even within t-tests, there are different kinds of t-tests that we can use for different use cases. Um, essentially, so how do you decide which t-test you want to use? So first and foremost, we spoke about how if you're comparing two groups, and t-test is again limited to comparing just two groups. If, we, if you have more than that, there's a, a different, different tests that you will use. Um, that's the first point that you, it, it, it is relevant for two comparison between two groups. Uh, the other aspect is that typically t-test uses means, and if it's proportions, you might have to utilize something else. Uh, sometimes it happens that when we talk about in the real world, uh, things like you, uh, if, if you folks are familiar, uh, if you're doing something related to kind of um, digital analytics and things like that, you might be interested in metrics such as click-through rates or other kinds of conversion rates or other kinds of rates, which are technically proportions. But you typically use averages of these metrics too. And with large enough sample sizes, it is okay to use a t-test, even though you're not really dealing with, an app, with a true mean, but a mean of a proportion, if that makes sense. Okay, so jumping into the types of t-test here, there are two broad categories. The test can be paired or unpaired, and it can be parametric or non-parametric. What do those things mean? 
So essentially paired or unpaired is when the data of both groups come from the same participants. Um, for example, if it is coming from the same, same group of participants and you are looking at two groups from there, there is potentially some relation between the two, which is, which is what makes it like a paired t-test. And if, the, if they are absolutely independent or coming from two different sets of participants, then there is no kind of um, interaction between the two, which is why we call them unpaired or independent um, t-test. If we look at like the little chart that we have to the right, it talks about the different t-tests that are available to us. And you might have seen in articles or elsewhere or even in your work, uh, the most common ones that we hear about are the student t-test and the Welch's t-test, which is usually because we deal with um, the unpaired sort of uh, groups in our hypothesis testing, typically. Now, how are these two different, the student t-test and the Welch's t-test? That um, is dependent on the variances of the group. If you recall, variance is nothing but if you take one group or one sample and you kind of plot the distribution of the different values that are relevant to whatever metric you're trying to um, look for, the, the wider the distribution, the more variance there is in the group. The narrower it is, the less variance or tightly coupled the different data points are. Now, it is possible that between the two groups, when you do an unpaired test, they might have equal variances, which means that the distribution is uh, largely similar or the width of the distribution is pretty much the same which makes it almost equal variances. And in that case, you can use a student t-test. Um, but if the weak variances are not equal, you, there's a different approach that we take. And there's a slight difference in essentially the formulae that these tests um, use, which is why we have two different scenarios here. And in that case, you'll use a Welch's t-test. One, one call out that I wanna make here is Again, when you're using this in your workplace or sometimes even in academia, you may not know what the variances of those groups are, or it might be hard to kind of calculate. And you might not be sure if those variances between the two groups you're looking at are equal or not. In that case, it is always recommended to use the Welch's t-test because then um, it'll give you more accuracy going in with that kind of assumption or ambiguity of not knowing if the variances are equal or not. So it's just better to go with the Welch's t-test. But if you're absolutely sure that the variances are equal, then you can just use your student t-test. All right. Sneha, Any yeah. Yeah, Sneha. So we have a question in the chat. So uh, it says, can you repeat what is the difference between two and one tailed? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I... Um, I just, I guess I forgot to meant to talk about that. So thank you for bringing it up. All right. So what is one tailed and two tailed test? So when you talk about your null hypothesis, we are saying that between the two groups, uh, essentially your means are identical. Now, there are two ways of thinking about your alternate hypothesis. One is directional. The other is not. So on the left under the one tail t-test column that you see is the more directional approach, which means that in your alternate hypothesis, you're saying the mean of one group is greater than the other, or you could say the mean of one group is less than the other. So when you have that inequality, it always implies some direction that you're looking for. You're trying to say, is it uh, to the right of your whatever population mean or whatever else reference point it might be, which makes it greater than or less than. In that case, it makes it a one-tailed t-test because you have a directional alternate hypothesis, which means that you have an inequality in your um, alternate hypothesis. When you talk about an alternate hypothesis where you're just trying to establish that the means are different between the two groups. Now, different can be one is less than the other, 
or uh, mean of group one is less than the other, uh, the mean of group two, or it's greater than the mean of uh, group two, it can be either of those, but we are not interested in that. We are only interested in establishing if the means are equal or are they diff different in some sense. In that case, there's no directionality. You're only looking at the inequality or equality of means, which makes it a two-tailed t-test. Uh, the graphs down below are kind of interchanged uh, compared to what is written on top. So please don't get confused with that. Um, I hope that's clear. If there are any more questions around that, uh, we, we can take that at the end, if that's okay. Okay, so moving on. Right, so now we spoke about different t-tests. We, let's say we decided on one and because the most common t-test is the Welch's for reasons that I mentioned previously. Let's take that as an example and talk about what do you do now? You decided your test, you have two groups, you're gonna compare their means. So what are we gonna do with it now? How are we actually going to utilize the t-test methodology? So there is kind of a formula which might look intimidating, but this is mostly for understanding purposes. It is very, very rare for anybody to actually compute things by hand. Um, usually you have large data sets, many data points, you have so many packages available in R or Python, you can even use Excel to just directly make these computations. So please don't feel overwhelmed or intimidated just by the formulae. Um, what, so, so what we do is uh, basically the formula utilizes your uh, number of observations in both group one, group two, their means, and their, um, it can be variances or it can be standard deviation. If you recall, your standard deviation and variances are related to each other and your standard deviation is, um, can also be utilized in this formula. So essentially you need to calculate for both group one and two, you should know what are the total number of observations. Most like most cases will have both as like equal if there are total, let's say a hundred um, in group one, there might be hundred in group two, that's like a common scenario. But there are cases in experimentation where that might not be the case. Uh, so you need to know what those observations are in both your groups, what are their means, what are their um, variances or standard deviations. You can plug those things into this formula and get something that's called a T-score or a T-statistic. Again, like I said, you can just get this by means of utilizing Excel or any other um, kind of data science uh, package that you might be familiar with. Now, what happens after you get this T-score? That's not like the end of it. You can't, uh, can't conclude anything based on this. Um, what you can do is there are some, for every test, there are like standardized tables which are basically giving you certain values, which we call as critical values, um, corresponding to different significance levels and thresholds that Mansi spoke, spoke about earlier. Now, what you do is you will take the T-score that you obtained here, and you will go to your standard T-table. And for based on your tests, significance level and the parameters that you set, let's say 5%, right? You're going to go down into that table and get a corresponding critical value that is a standardized value from the table. And then you make a comparison between the T-score that you calculated for your groups and compare it with that critical value. Now that comparison is what will tell you whether you can reject your null or not. So just like you use your p-value and a value of uh, alpha is 0 0.05 and you make a comparison. Similarly, if your t-score is uh, kind of lesser than your uh, critical value, you can check the null. If not, you don't have enough evidence to do that. Okay, so moving on. Now, 
every time we talk about t-test or try to read up, uh, look at different resources, you might come across something called a z-test. And I just wanted to highlight really quickly what the difference between the two is and which one you should use. So basically z-test is pretty much the same thing as your t-test, but the difference is if you know what your population's variance is, or if you have like a really large sample, you can use your z-test the same way you as you would use a t-test. But if you don't know what the population variance is, or if you don't have a large sample size, then t-test is what will give you more accurate statistics to kind of validate your null hypothesis. And again, in the real world, it is very common to use t-test because population variances are unknown to us. Okay, let's move on to the chi-square test now. So this is essentially used for categorical variables. Um, what that means is if you are trying to understand uh, impact of gender, on test scores of, um, of students in a class. So gender is your categorical variable where you have male and female or, or something else. Um, and you want to make comparison based on that. So you what you will use in that case is a chi-squared test. And this is a little bit different from your typical t-test or z-test in the sense that there are two types of chi-squared tests. There are two purposes for this. One is you can check goodness of fit, and we'll, we'll just talk about what that means in a little bit, or you can test for association or independence. Um, again, for example, if you wanted to understand if being male or female has any impact on what kind of score um, you get on a test, you're trying to understand if there's any association between gender and test scores. So that can kind of be an example for testing for association or independence. And again, like t-test, there are some assumptions uh, for uh, to be checked for the chi-square test, some of which are similar to the t-test, like the sample should be randomly picked from the population, the categories, are mutually exclusive um, categories, mean, meaning the categories in your categorical variable. Um, and the data has to be in some sort of frequency, right? Like if you have categorical variables, you need to have counts or frequencies that are kind of aligned with the different categories. And the data should not consist of paired samples or groups, because here we're trying to test for association or independence even, right? So if you already have uh, paired samples or groupings, then we're not able to determine any independence. Uh, it doesn't make, make any sense to run the test. Okay, moving on. Uh, and for the sake of time, I might sound like I am rushing through a little bit, but if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box and uh, we'll try to get to them towards the end of the session. Now, what does goodness of fit mean? Essentially, you're trying to look at observed values and expected values, and you want to understand how different the observed values might be from expected values. So when you have such a scenario, you can use the chi-squared test to check for how close or uh, apart those might be. And you have like a really straightforward formula here where you, which uses the observed and the expected values. And if we look at the small example here, for, for example, you are rolling a fair die 120 times. So you can expect each of those numbers one through six to occur equally every in every roll. So your expected values would be 20, 20, 20, 20 every time. Uh, I mean, for all the numbers. But what you actually observe when you roll the die for 120 times is what you see in the observed column, like 10, 25, whatever the distribution might be. So obviously those numbers are different from what you expect, which is every number one through six should have like equal um, likelihood of occurring. 
Now, what you can do is just plug in those observed and expected values in the formula, take the corresponding differences and compute the chi-square value. And then you again do the same process of going into a standard table, pick the critical value from there and compare your chi-square to that critical value. And you can reject the null hypothesis or not based on that comparison. So that methodology is, is very similar between these tests, but the purposes and the scenarios for which you will use them are what make them uh, different. All right, going on to the next slide. Now, the other use case for chi-square test is to test for association or independence between the two different groups. Uh, and because we are talking about association or independence, uh, you might have heard of correlation and Pearson's correlation is like a common term that we hear in machine learning. Uh, so again, this is also the Pearson's chi-square test of association because it's again talking about relationship between the two groups. And you will use this when you have categorical data for two independent variables and you want to see what is the relationship between them. So here is like another example. Again, we're using gender as our categorical variable. We're talking about broadly boys and girls and whether they failed in a test or passed. If you just look at the, the top part of the example on the left side, you'll see just eyeballing the numbers, uh, slightly more number of girls passed on the test than the boys, right? So you might end up concluding that there is some relation of gender on whether you will are, are likely to pass the test or not. But what we want to do here is use a statistical method to determine whether that assumption is true or not. So what you will do for this kind of test is just calculate the row and column totals. For example, for the first row, you'll add up 17 and 20, second row, eight and five, similarly for the column. And then you will calculate something called expected frequency, which is given by the formula that you see on the slide. Once you have expected frequency calculated for each and every cell in the table, you can write it down below the actual values as you see in the second portion at the bottom left. So all the values in brackets are, or in parentheses are the ones that are expected frequencies and the other ones are the actual values. And then you will, um, calculate the value of chi-square using the same formula we saw in the previous slide, which uses your observed and expected values. So your observed values are um, here in the bottom one and the expected are the calculated ones that you just calculated using expected frequency formula. So you plug those in, you calculate your chi-square, and then you add up those chi-square values um, for all the cells. And in this case, it's already calculated here. We get a value of 0.9354. And then uh, you, you calculate the degrees of freedom, which I, I don't want to go into details of right now because that, that's another concept that'll take up some time. Essentially, it's, it, it just relates to the number of variables that can affect your outcome of the test. Uh, that's kind of a high level understanding of what that might mean. And that is essential in uh, for us to kind of get to the critical value that you can get from, again, a standardized table. Once you have that critical value, you will again make the comparison. Here we um, looked up the critical value for the specific example, which comes out to be 3.84. And you kind of make the comparison and you decide whether you're rejecting the null hypothesis or not. All right, we'll move on to ANOVA really quickly and we're not going to go into much detail into ANOVA because we also want to talk a little bit about experimentation. Um, this is another technique that you can use, which is useful when you have more than two samples, uh, sorry, more than two groups you want to compare. Uh, this is essentially a one-way analysis of variance. And what happens is when you have two groups and you're trying to compare their means, for instance, 
when you utilize your t-test or chi-square test, you're essentially taking the difference between the means and then making computations on top of that. When you have more than two groups, there'll be various number or, or, or different combinations of pairs that you might need to do the same process for. And as your number of groups keep on increasing, uh, the integrity in completing that process and determining the validity of null hypothesis decreases, which is why it is risky to utilize a t-test or uh, a similar test when you have more than two groups. Instead, what you want to do is use a test that actually, um, you know, looks for not comparing the different pairs of group means, but it looks at the entire collection of group means and determines if they are spread apart from each other or they are closer to each other and then kind of helps you um, rule out the null hypothesis or not. Okay. Um, are there any questions on any of these tests before we can move on to the next portion? We have one question from Sakshi. So the question is, what are the scenarios or situations when one should decide to go with one-tailed t-test or two-tailed t-test? Okay, so um, like we mentioned, if you wanted to check, uh, for example, you are trying to compare the average scores of a class with some kind of reference score in a test that you have. For example, 60 was the historical uh, test score for a certain subject, and you were trying to understand if the average score for, that, for the same subject's test of a class in the current year is going to be higher than that or not. In that case, you are in your alternate hypothesis trying to understand if something for, for your group of interest is higher than either a population um, mean or statistic or for a different group, maybe. So when you're trying to establish an inequality in your between your two groups and their means, that is when you will use a one-tailed t-test, which is more directional. Um, when you're just trying to say that I have two different classrooms, I'm going to look at their average scores on a test, and I just am interested in knowing if those were exactly the same or were they different from each other. And in that case, you will use a two-tailed t-test because there you don't care if the score was higher than the other or less than the other. Does that make sense? All Thanks right. for the clarification, Sneha. Uh, Sakshi says, yeah. yes, it makes sense. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Okay. So I would like to quickly walk through the last section, which is experimentation in the real world. So that itself is like a really huge topic. So I'm kind of just going to run through it. But we wanted to at least touch upon it because experimentation is a really up and coming field that is used for multiple purposes today. And you might have heard A-B testing, online control experiments and things like that, which are very um, common these days, especially in like uh, web analysis, digital marketing and all sorts of things. So experimentation or even A-B testing has foundations in all the hypothesis testing methodologies that we just spoke about. And you use literally all the concepts that we spoke about today in this process. So some of the use cases are, like I mentioned, uh, you, you make some uh, change on your web page. For example, you change the color of a button or you reposition something that uh, on your web page that was at the top, maybe you move it to the bottom or do something like that. And you want to check what happens when you make that change. Does it make your users or customers um, click more on a button that you change the color for? Or if you change the position of, let's say, your shopping cart from left to right or top to bottom, does that make people buy more things or buy fewer things? So that's, again, like essentially hypothesis testing, and which is more commonly referred to as A-B testing. 
in in the, in the world of uh, the uh, software. So here we have two examples. On the left that you see is more like rudimentary experimentation where you kind of plant 10 seeds each in two different pots and you put them in the exact same spot next to each other. So they have the same sunlight, same shade, whatever it might be. You use the exact same soil in the pots and you put the same amount of measured amount of water in both the pots on exactly the same number of days. So essentially what you're doing to both the pots is complete, uh, is uh, exactly the same. And I'm sorry, you might use one thing that is different. It can be different amount of water, or you can put them in different spots to have different exposure of sunlight. So any one variable can be different. And that is what you're testing for. And you want to see that how many seeds sprout in each of those pots and whether there was a difference caused by different amount of water that was used or different soil or any anything that you changed between the two and the thing to uh, the, the picture to the right is the a b testing that we just spoke about moving on we'll just quickly talk about what is experimental design and i'll just highlight like a very common example which you'll use, you which you'll see in many articles and textbooks related to a b testing even so for example you want to change the color of a button on your website, maybe the place an order or a buy now button that was earlier blue and now you want to change it to green. And it might seem like a very trivial change uh, to, uh, to a common person, but it can actually make, make a difference, right? So what you do is you establish a null hypothesis and you say that if I change the color of my button from blue to green, there's not going to be any difference in the number of orders that I get on my website on a, a, any given day. That's my null hypothesis. And typically here we use like a two-tail test. So you're not interested in number of orders were higher or lower. Typically we talk about number of orders being different. They could be higher or lower. Now in the real world, if you want to understand what is the impact or how are you going to measure this, right? There can be number of orders. You can talk about number of clicks on the button. It can be something else even. So the, what we call these are essentially your primary, secondary, and guardrail metrics. So because we are talking about place an order button, your primary metric could be number of orders received in a day. And your secondary metric can be something like number of clicks you get on um, on the button. This is again in conjunction with your business stakeholders, your product or whatever it might be. Um, and guardrail metrics or counter metrics are something that you don't want those to be impacted when you make changes while running a test or an experiment. So you don't want your website to suddenly become super slow or super laggy. Like if Google made a, a change and they're trying to run a test and you're trying to search for something, it takes, I don't know, a couple of seconds more than it would normally have. We start getting impatient because we're not used to that. Um, so you don't want like your uh, speed of loading your website, for example, in this example to go down and that can be your guardrail metric. Now, um, the third is kind of not very relevant here. What, what, what it means is you want to understand when you run a test, uh, how much of a change can you expect in your number of orders? For example, if you were getting 100 orders each day with a blue colored button, can you, are, you going, are you expecting to get 50 more orders, which makes it 150 orders per day? That is again, a very business specific question. So, and why that is important for us to know is so that we are able to calculate what the sample size is and how long you should run your test. I think that that was also a question that was asked in the first half of the portion. How many experiments are we going to run? I know Mansi spoke about maybe two is not enough and six could have kind of given more evidence to reject the null hypothesis. So how do we know if a good number is six or 10 or 100, right? So this process of power analysis, which uses points three and four uh, on the slide, is what will tell you what your sample size should be 
and how long you should run your test for. So typical significance level, like Mansi also mentioned, is 5%. So you use alpha of 0 0.05. And power of the test, again, a concept that unfortunately we are out of time for, is usually 80% that's used in the industry. Based on this, you will calculate your sample sizes. There are many calculators out, out, out there, or you can even use by Python packages to compute that number. And it'll tell you that how many observations should be in your test group and how many should be in your control group. And whether and you can decide whether you want to run equal sizes in both and then run your experiment or your test. And finally, uh, most common test to use is your t-test. Uh, in some cases, you can even look for proportions. You can use chi-square test or something else. Um, and then come up with a p-value, which you can compare with your alpha. And if it's less than your alpha, you will you have evidence to reject your null hypothesis. And using all these kind of uh, parameters, you can you can come up with your experiment, run it, and then analyze it. And then you can recommend whether you should change the color of the button from blue to green or not. Okay, so that's it. Uh, are there any questions that are unanswered? Thank you so much, Sneha. It was really great. Uh, we have one question from Carol. Um, mm -hmm. In your data science role, do you typically work with a separate person who does QA or are you doing your own QA? Do you typically discuss your plan methodology to test your hypothesis before beginning the work with someone else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great question. So I. I work in the experimentation domain itself. So every time I have to design and propose an experiment design, it is always in conjunction with business stakeholders because some of the points that I mentioned in the last slide, uh, you need to understand what the business is expecting in terms of what kind of change can we expect, what kind of change we want to detect in the experiment. And then uh, so product and maybe engineering or business stakeholders are typically the ones that I work with. And then you come up as, as a data scientist that works in experimentation, it's very common to come up with an experiment design, but you cannot do that all by yourself because you need these inputs coming in from um, your business stakeholders. Uh, but it's also possible in many cases that Many times strategy teams or business teams or product teams, they don't know that they what they are what they want to, what, what they expect. Like they don't know. It's some if it's something completely new or radical, you don't have a baseline or an expectation to go in with. In that case, you can take up multiple scenarios and propose different sample sizes, different test durations, and then work with these teams to. Uh, understand the trade-offs and come up with a plan that makes sense for everybody. I hope that answers your question. That was great. That was really insightful, Sneha. And in the chat, people are actually cheering for both of you uh, as speakers and they're giving you great feedback. So thanks so much to both of you as speakers. We have a question about the quiz. So uh, the quiz will be in the next session along with a uh, coding workshop, but it will be more like a fun quiz. So don't worry too much about it. If you have followed through these uh, sessions, the concepts, uh, they will be related to that. They will be from there. It won't be super complicated. You don't have to study anything extra. If you just, basically we want to try I just to check the basic understanding uh, of uh, yours, uh, just to see if it, it this series helped you in, in a way. So don't worry too much about it. Just try to have fun. Yeah, it'll, it won't be like numericals or like you'll have to actually solve anything. Like uh, uh, whenever like uh, we were asking the type one, type two error from the pregnant and not pregnant case, uh, the questions and the scenarios will revolve around the same kind of examples only. Awesome. So that was it. If we don't have any more questions, then uh, 
that's all uh, and thanks again to our speakers and thanks so much to our volunteers who worked really hard behind this series uh, in the moderation we had runjun elin christine uh, who helped throughout the chat so thanks to uh, all of them and all of you thanks so much for attending today have a great rest, rest of the weekend <laughs>